Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege uh, to be here and to be talking to you about a passion of ours, BISP, the custodian of the poor. And when we say that we are humbled to be working and we part of this mission, we truly are humbled to be there. And I hope you will understand why I use the word humbled, uh, because when you talk about custodians of the poor, uh, there aren't that many organizations that can make such a large claim. It is a very large claim, and I hope that you will understand why uh, we have made this claim today. So let's start by talking about uh, BISP, which is the largest social safety net of Pakistan. And it is definitely the custodian of the poor, because what we do is we take care of the poorest of the poorest women of Pakistan. And we have identified a, um, a me mechanism, a survey system. So it's not just done offhand, just like handing forms out like it used to be. But now what's been happening recently is that there is a system by which uh, the uh, registry has been set up. And the registry is called Pakistan's only poverty database. It's called the National Socioeconomic Registry of Pakistan. And it has uh, the demographics of the poorest of the poor women of Pakistan. Now, what that means is that we know exactly where the poor are, what they're doing, how well they're not educated, mostly, uh, what their skill sets are, mostly not that many skill sets, unfortunately, uh, what their age brackets are, what their disability brackets are, where they're living, what they're doing, and what do they actually need. Uh, what they need is, of course, cash. And what do they need cash for? They need cash for something pretty basic. And when I say something pretty basic, it is basic. It is food. And it is saving them from death. And when I say it's saving them from death, I really do mean it. Uh, we take care of the poorest of the poor, 5.2 million women and families of Pakistan, to ensure that they don't die of hunger. And that is why I use the word humbling at the beginning. Because when you're trying to do something as large as that, and you're tr trying to do it through technology, it is a humbling experience. And the way we do it is we give out um, debit cards. We have been working on different options, on different technology options. And the recent is a debit card, which is given to these women, poorest of the poor, and they use that to get the cash out. Now, that's one side of it. They get $45 uh, every quarter, and that takes care of their food needs. That makes sure that they don't die of hunger. However, that's just part of it. What else do we do at BISP? We do something which is actually, for me, uh, personally, one of the most um, exciting uh, times to be at BISP, because what we do is we try and give them dignity, empowerment, and a meaning to life. Now, wherever the poor are, in whichever country in the world, frankly, these are the three things that they should be looking at, everyone should be looking at. Because the poor in every single country are lacking, of course, food and cash, which of course any government can give them, uh, provided they have the budgets. But they should also be looking at giving them empowerment, meaning to life, and dignity. And the reason I say that is because when these three things are missing, there's very little hope for these poor. So you're looking at a strata of people who are right at the bottom of the pyramid. And they're not just at the bottom of the pyramid because of circumstances, they're at the bottom of the pyramid because of many other reasons. And the idea is to lift them out. To lift them out, not just by giving them cash, but by giving them something extra. And that is the extra I want to talk about. So we will talk about technology, but we will talk about the extras, because the extras is all that matters uh, when it comes to really being custodians of the poor. So the first thing is reducing hunger. So we have talked about how uh, the cash stipend which comes into their bank accounts, which they take out through ATM cards, uh, is used mostly on food and is used on uh, feeding their children and making sure that their children and themselves have a little bit more nutrition than before. This is not a lot of food, but this is basic food. This is not food which is <laughs> very expensive, this is cheap food. Uh, let's hope that it's nutritious food, and that is something we'll be talking about later, whether it is nutritious and how can we make things uh, nutritious. If we can manage this side of it, we can move to the next side, which is health. We are also custodians of their health. And when I talk about health, we're not just talking about the health programs that all governments run. We're talking about uh, not just the health insurance schemes, etc., but we're talking about something far more critical. Something I personally am very passionate about, and I want everyone in Pakistan to be extremely passionate about, because if we're not passionate about nutrition, malnutrition, stunting, and immunization, we would have lost 3% of our GDP. Now, when you look at the numbers, and you say you can lose 3% of GDP, and you 
tell this to a person who's on the, uh, on the finance side or on the account side, uh, then I think they start listening better. When you talk to them just about nutrition, maybe they won't understand. But GDP growth rate is something that everyone understands. So we are losing 3% GDP growth rate. Why? Because we have not been able to manage uh, the nutritious cycle. So we at BISP are very passionate about that. We're trying to do programs which will encourage our poor to eat better. So they're cooking the same food, but we want them to cook them the same food, the same cheap food that they have access to in a better way. We want to do conditional cash transfers. So first, Let's look at the legislative side of it. Legislative side of it, we are trying to handle. Not that complicated, in fact. It really just requires sorting the oil, the flour, and the salt. If we can fortify these three, which we're trying legislatively to do for the entire country in one go, then we would have taken care of the malnutrition side of it. And we would have reduced the stunting levels. Currently, 44% of children are stunted. means they have smaller IQs. If they have smaller IQs, they definitely cannot be a productive workforce for Pakistan. So we can build as many bridges as we want. We can have as many big projects as we want. But if our workforce is just has smaller brains, we cannot really progress from developing to develop. And that is a serious challenge. That is what we're working on. So the legislative side, we're working on. And then we're trying to look into conditional cash transfers. We want to be able to give our women, our mothers, something extra so that they are encouraged to go out and vaccinate their children against polio, against other, uh, other diseases. They're encouraged to go and do um, um, other things like family planning. Yes, family planning in Pakistan, a word which is a taboo, which is never used, but yes, we're going to use it, but which we use, in other words, also we call it f uh, mother and child health. And what we're trying to explain to these women in far off places and in distant places in the entire country is that if you have a gap of two years, it's better for your health, it's better for the child, there'll be less mortalities, and more than that, it's better for the country as well because you will actually be able to reap the dividends of your demographic situation versus the disaster side of it. So family planning, a very important component of it. Nutrition, I explained, stunting, something that you really, really don't want in this country. And of course, um, the, the most important thing is making sure that what they eat is actually uh, the best, even though it's, a, it's the cheapest. So this is another side of this, which perhaps you don't get to hear of, that when you think of the largest social safety net, you only think of cash handouts through credit cards. Well, this is also something that we're um, busy working on. I now want to move to the other um, area where we are definitely custodians. And when I say custodians, I say it uh, very proudly, because in education, we have definitely left our mark. And what we're doing in education is that we have managed to enroll, ladies and gentlemen, one million children of Pakistan. That is not a small number. <laughs> one million children means what? One million children means, of which 47% are girls, which is good because girls getting enrolled means future empowerment, women empowerment, more women empowerment, so we're extremely pleased and excited about that. But what that means is that one million children are not on the streets. One million children are not food and fodder for terrorists. One million children are in schools learning, and one million children are not in the child labor workforce. And the good news is these girls are not getting married early either because they're not they're in schools and they're known, they, don't, they don't have to go in for that. Because when they go in for early marriages, we all know what happens. They, there's more mater, uh, maternal mortalities on that side. So on the education side, definitely, by giving out a conditional cash transfer through the same debit cards you know, that we discussed earlier, the mothers are being able to send their children to school. Mothers are loving it, they want more. When you talk to a mother, they say, the mother always wants something more for her child. Everyone who's a mother understands this, um, and mothers want to be able to give more and more to their children. So they're saying, well, you're taking care of the children who are from five years to 12 years, but we want to do more. We want to send them for secondary education too. So I hope the BIS will be able to get funds to be able to do that. For the moment, we're just concentrating on primary education, and we have managed about 37% enrollment. Now, 37% enrollment uh, is a start. We have a long way to go. We're excited on the journey. But also adult literacy. I want you to think about the captive audience that we have. These 5.2 million women are divided in 45,000 uh, best, best beneficiary committees, which means that we'll, we're able to access them more easily. And they are captive audience. Every month, they meet once a month, and they talk for one hour about anything. So this is a perfect platform to be able to do adult literacy programs for them. Now, 
I don't need to explain what that means. If five million women from the poorest strata were to be get educated, what does it mean? It truly is revolutionary. It is women empowerment in the real sense. Because when you have that many women who are zero literate, and within six months, with the right kind of funding, if you can take them to literacy, you can imagine what it would do to your society. It would be a complete revolution is a small word. It would be a game changer is another small word. I can keep using these small, small words, but I want you to feel it. If the poorest of the poor women have this biggest armament in their hand, this, this weapon in their hand called education, they can really turn things around for themselves. An educated mother can really, really help an educated family and can just bring a better family into this world. So that is the education side of it. And now I want to move on to another passion of ours at BIS, which is women empowerment, but through legislation that has already happened. Now, our, I as a parliamentarian have been uh, lucky enough, fortunate enough to be part of this process of legislation in the last nine years, whereby we've seen a lot of progressive women legislation come up in Pakistan. And that's the good news. Now, to be fair to all of us who've been part of this progressive legislation, whether it's on uh, harassment at workplace, or domestic violence, or my own legislation on acid violence, have we actually reached out and been able to explain to these women uh, what their rights are? I don't think so. So here's a perfect platform called BIS, which has these committees where we can use these committees to be able to explain to these women what their rights are. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to explain through these committees, so it's not just cash handouts, which is what you all thought. It's actually a lot more than that. It's explaining what their rights are through these women empowerment committees. And now, finally, something that everyone knows that BIS does, but how do we do it? Well, financial inclusion. What that means is 5.2 million women who did not have ID cards now have a right to vote because the uh, prerequisite for getting a payment, a cash transfer, is that they need to have a CNIC. And the only way they're going to get a payment is if they have a CNIC, when they have a CNIC, they have a choice in terms of voting. So we have gotten that many women into the voting uh, arena, into the political arena. So we have politically empowered that many m women. And when so many of the poorest women are politically empowered and they have a right to say yes or no, I think generally, uh, that's called progression, that's called upward mobility for a lot of them. I also want to say that um, in terms of financial inclusion, uh, these women had never perhaps had an ID of their own. They had never moved out of their houses, they're now moving out of their houses, they're going to the uh, nearest town centers, they're going and accessing ATMs, they'd never seen an ATM machine before. And they're accessing mobile phone banking. And the latest, which we're extremely excited about, is the biometric system. They put their thumbs on, they get biometrically verified, and they get cash payments through that. So these are all the different technologies we're using with illiterate women. And yes, it is an uphill task because you need to explain the technology to them. But yes, we have brought them into the center. We have brought them where the technology is, and we have brought them where the empowerment is. With financial inclusion, and the access to so much in terms of bank accounts comes choices. And the, one of the choices that I'm passionate about is the loans that we're giving out. And these are interest-free loans for, the, for Pakistan, uh, which really works well. And these loans, what it does is that it takes these women who are only taking the money, and it takes them from being just takers of money into givers. Now, when I say givers, what do I mean by givers? Givers means that they have access to the loan, and they're able to give jobs to others. Through that loan, they're able to take, perhaps a woman could take uh, four sewing machines and give four people employment. And as a result, get into the self-employment. Now, this is finally the tipping point. I think what we are trying to do is, we're not just trying to do poverty management, we are also trying to do poverty alleviation. We're trying to move them out of that bottom pyramid, up on that pyramid, so that they can actually think of better lives. Because if we can't do that, I think we haven't served the actual purpose of why we're there as custodians of the poor. Finally, I just want to say, it's a very exciting journey. It's an exciting journey and a humbling journey because what you're looking at is you are looking at the tipping point, the turning point, where these women are able to have a little bit more than just cash. They have dignity, they have empowerment, and they have the ability to have better, more meaningful lives. And that is a mission that, frankly, each one of us is on. We're extremely lucky that we're part of this mission. We feel very blessed to be part of this mission. And we'd like all of you to be part of this mission, too, in your own way. 
and work with us so that we can help our poor get out of poverty, graduate from poverty, and truly have more meaningful lives. It's not a different, difficult process. Let me explain. I just want to say the reason it's not difficult because it's your belief in the human workforce. It is not just your belief in, we're talking about ideas. When we come to TEDx, what do we talk about? Ideas. Well, it's your idea for what? For people to be able to exit gloom and doom and to be able to have better, more meaningful lives. So each one of us are putting in our bit. I'm very happy that we, my, my team at BISF, all of us are putting in our little drops and I hope that somewhere along the line we'll get all of you to put in your little drops so that we can actually make this journey faster. And finally, I want to say that Pakistan definitely started 1947, we're sitting in 2016, and we're, what we're looking at is a country moving from developing to developed. The country cannot move from developing to developed if we don't do our jobs right of taking care and being custodians of the poor. Thank you very much.